our, our, our relationships aren't limited to our weaknesses. We actually have the strength of the Holy Spirit that we're inviting into our relationships. Our relationships aren't limited by our own personalities and all the personality profiles we do to make sure we connect and all of that. We're actually, we're actually inviting the, the person of the Holy Spirit to release something in our relationships that we can't release on our own. But it can be released in an atmosphere of honor. Well, I am super honored to be here today. Um, since you're in a relationship series, I just want to introduce you to my top three. Um, I think I have a picture there. This is my family, and this is, let's see if we got it. There we go. Um, so I have right here to my left, your right, that is my son, Jefferson. And Jefferson has been a miracle from day one. I have always said I wanted five boys, because I played basketball, I wanted a basketball team, and God gave me one, right? And he, he's been the blessing of five, and I've always said he's been my heart walking around on the outside of my body for his entire life. And a couple of years back, he walked down the aisle, my heart walked down the aisle, right? And he married the girl of his dreams, Cassie, and they now live two streets away from us, and that is just way too far for me. Um, but... <laughs> We're having a great time loving. They're in ministry at the church. And then my husband, Todd. And Todd's gonna be with you guys um, next month. Super excited about that to come back. But Todd has, has been, I've known Todd since we were in the seventh and eighth grade. We met each other in youth group, in middle school. So meet your spouse in the house. And if you're in high school or middle school, you don't know who's sitting next to you. But we met in middle school, and, um, and so we dated. And when I say dated, I mean we went out to pizza with the youth group, in groups a lot. Um, all the way through high school and college, we dated off and on. He always says it was more on than off, but I have the microphone. I'll tell you the true story. It was definitely more off than on. And when it was time for me to go to college, I was a year older and so I went away my freshman year and I stayed true to Todd my entire freshman year I did not date anybody but then it was time for Todd to go to college and so we had the 1980s Christian dating couple conversation and that was that it was time to release each other to find God's will so what good Christian girl is not going to release the future man of God to find his will and so we released each other and for 18 months he was in the Midwest at college. I was at Florida Atlantic University down in Florida. And, um, and we were, we had this long distance, we were not we, off, 18 month off season. And when I say off, I mean off. Like for those of you under 40, there were no cell phones, so there was no texting, right? But there was a, 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 a pay phone in the dorm hallway, which I would save my quarters and maybe once every few weeks we'd talk to each other. There, there were no DMs or social media. We didn't know we did, what each other were doing on, on a weekly basis. And so, um, so yeah, we, there are a few letters here and there. Well, Todd comes home on a break, one winter break. And so we started doing what we did. We hang out with the, the youth group for pizza. And then one night he asked me for dinner. And I'm like, sure, I'll go to dinner. And lo and behold, we did not go to Pizza Hut. He took me to a really nice restaurant. I'm like, this is nice. And then at one point, he reaches over and he holds my hand. I'm like, well, friends are friends forever, if the Lord's the Lord of them. <laughs> Another 80s dating reference. And then at the end of that night, Todd gets down on one knee, pulls out a ring, and asks me to marry him. Right? And my first response was, no way. Are you kidding me? And he's, he's like, is that yes, no way, or no, no way? And so after the initial shock wore off, and I made a phone call to the other guy that I was kind of in an on again, off again relationship with. <laughs> I said yes. And we've been married for the last 35 years and I should have known from the very beginning that it was gonna be a wild ride with lots of twists and turns. But after 35 years, we actually feel like we're just getting started. And we have not arrived, but there have been a few lessons that we've learned over the last 35 years. And we are passionate about, about equipping God's people to flourish in relationships, in their marriage, in their family, as single people, in community. We're, we're passionate about this, and this is why I love this series that your church is in. It's all about relationships, because this is the one thing that all of us have in common. We are all in relationships, 
And there's a few things I know about relationships. Here's what I know. I know that, that God has a specific plan for your relationships. And your pastors talked about this last week. They talked about John 10, 10, how you have a real enemy that is out to rob and kill and destroy. But can I tell you that Jesus did not come so that you would be a victim of robbery. He came to give you a life and life to the full. And part of that abundant full life is that you would experience life-giving relationships, that you would have an abundance of connection and intimacy. And you may be here today and, and, and you're struggling in relationships or maybe you've settled and, and you're thinking, well, this relationship has always been this way, so it's always gonna be this way. And what I want you to know is that we're believing for you what you may not even be able to believe for yourself because we believe that God has a specific plan and it is to give, breathe life into your relationships. And so if you're here and you have relationship problems, you are in great company because here's the second thing I know. We all have relationships that need work. We, we all have relationships that, that need some help. We all have relationship problems. And if you're sitting here today and you don't think that you have any relationship problems, you may be the problem, right? <laughs> so I'm here for you. And I'm here for you if you're sitting next to the person who thinks that there is no problem. And that, that leads me to the last part is that we know that, that life is really all about relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with the people that he put in our lives, those closest to us. And we know this because being in ministry for as long as I have, I've been alongside people when they've been on their deathbed. And, and there, there are two things on their mind. They're not thinking about whether or not the visa bill is gonna get paid or whether the cat is gonna get fed, right? The cat's gonna go a little hungry. They're, they're thinking about their relationship with God because they know they're getting ready to meet him or not meet him and the relationships of the people closest to them. Did their life matter? Did it count? And what I want you to hear is that, that I believe that God's plan for you is that you would not settle for anything less than God's plan for your relationships, right? And I also know that this is the one place that you're gonna go this week that is completely committed to helping you thrive in every area, but primarily in your relationship with God and in your relationship with the people he's put in your lives. This is the only place you're gonna go. So when you lean into this series, remember that, that even though if you lean in and, and you press in and, and take, take in what God wants to impart on your life in this series, that, that you're not gonna end up with perfect relationships because there's not any perfect people. But since you are the common denominator of every single relationship that you are in right now, if you will lean in and press in, your relationships are gonna get at least 50% better, right? Because you're gonna get better. When you get better, your relationships are gonna get better. So this is all about you pressing into all that God has for you. And this is why I love, I love the fact that you're in this relationship series because it's, it's so vital and so important. And, and this is the deal is that we have all actually been hardwired for relationships. We, we've been created by a relational God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and we've been created in his image. We've been hard, it's, it's in our DNA, right? And we know this because the very first thing in scripture that God says is not good in the book of Genesis, it's not the devil, it's not sin, it's not even evil, it's actually isolation. In Genesis chapter two, it says this, it says that it is not good for man to be alone. And down deep inside, everyone knows this. We know we've been created for relationships. Even people that are not Christ followers, they, they know this. And I think that one of the, um, the greatest signs of that is that our culture is obsessed with trying to find the secret to good relationships, right? They're obsessed with it. As a matter of fact, if you look on TV right now, there are actually 750 reality TV shows. And almost all of them are about relationships, right? They're trying to discover the secret. I mean, I don't know if you've been watching TV lately. I'm not promoting any of these, but maybe you've seen some of these reality TV shows. We've got the 90 Day Fiance because it's always good, right, to jump into something this quick and from people from different parts of the world, right? There's another one called Love is Blind. It's always a great idea to trick someone into liking you. But this is the weirdest. I mean, this is one, this is so disturbing, and this is a new one. 
And it's, it's called Sexy Beasts. And this is the description. It aims to tackle superficial dating by wearing alien masks and disguises. So they've traded superficial for super weird, right? Church, we can do better than this, right? God has a better word to speak over your life and over your relationships. And this is the deal. That we have to be on guard for the lies and the myths that culture is trying to sell us when it comes to relationships as if they are the expert. And if you look at statistics of where the culture, where this has gotten us, just look at the statistics. And I'll, I'll just read a couple of them. Less than half the people that get married are gonna stay married. 20% of men and 15% of women are gonna have affairs. Someone gets divorced every 13 seconds. I mean, in what other area of life would we ever settle for these statistics? They stink, right? If someone told you that, that one out of every two people that eat burritos are gonna die, would you keep eating burritos and take your chances? I know you're in Texas and you guys really are passionate about your Mexican food, but would you do that? No, we would not, we would not do that. We would stop eating burritos and, and this is the deal, is, is that when it comes to relationships, and I'm not just talking about married people, I am talking about specifically to some of you singles out there that, that if, you're, if you want something different today and in the future, if you want something different than what everybody else has, you're gonna have to do something different than what everybody else is doing. Let me say that again. If you want something different than what culture is offering, you're gonna have to do something different than what culture is doing. And so for the next couple minutes, I wanna unpack this, this idea of, of the difference maker. And the title of my message, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, please write this down because I flew all the way from South Florida to share this with you. So the title of my message is The Real Difference Maker. The Real Difference Maker. And there are, there are so many resources out there about relationships and things that can make a difference. You know, one thing that really makes a big difference is you need to have a vision for your relationships, all of your relationships. And for our marriage, Todd and I have this vision that, that we wanna be more in love at 80 than we were at 18. And we want to chart a course for that. You, you also need to be intentional about relationships. Relationships do not happen naturally. As a matter of fact, anything left to grow on its own is called a weed, right? Nobody ever drifted together. There's this natural pull to drift apart. Great relationships take time and intentionality. It's important that we learn how to fight right and learn how to manage conflict according to God's word. Those are all important things, but I wanna to share today about the one thing that I believe is the greatest difference maker because it actually lays the foundation for everything else. So do you guys wanna hear the greatest difference maker, right? This is, this is the difference maker, right, between whether you're 16 or 60, whether, whether you're married or single, it's the difference between a marriage that, that barely survives and one that thrives. It, it's the difference between a home that is actually a haven or a little bit of hell on earth. It's, it's the difference between whether you are going to have a lid on your influence potential or whether you're going to have a release of the spirit and that your, your potential and your influence would be limitless. So if you're ready to hear it, I'm ready to tell you. you guys ready? North Campus, are you ready? Okay, before I tell you, I need to read some scripture because I haven't done a lot of that yet. So we are in church. So I'm going to read this because this is so, so clear in the gospel of Mark. And so I'm going I'm to read this passage of scripture see, in Mar and to set it up in Mark chapter 5, Jesus, his ministry is on fire. He just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He had he, 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 um, released people from demons. He's been healing. I mean, miracles. It is on fire, and he's all around the Sea of Galilee performing miracles and signs and wonders in Mark chapter five. But then at the beginning of Mark chapter six, he changes location, and it says this in Mark chapter six, verse one. It says, Jesus, he left that part of the country, the part of the country where, where miracles were happening and, and people were being raised from the dead. He left that part of the country, and he returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown, say hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him, they were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? They were deeply offended, and they refused to believe him. So you have to get the picture here. 
They're in Nazareth. Nazareth is this really small village where Jesus grew up. And so they're listening to him proclaim God's truth. But, and they're going, where did he get this wisdom? I mean, isn't he Joseph's son, like the carpenter? Didn't he help make my kitchen table? Didn't, is, didn't he, like, sit next to my son Eli at Hebrew school or play soccer with Reuben? I mean, he's just, he's just one of us. He, he's, just, he's just one of us. We've known him all his life. And so, so they refused to believe him. They were so close that they missed it. And then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored, say honored, everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he could not do any miracles among them. It does not say he would not. It says he could not. He was not offended. He was actually constrained. And I don't fully understand how the God who can move the immovable and, and do the impossible, how his supernatural power was limited in that moment. I don't fully understand it, but what we see is, is there was a place of honor where the supernatural was flowing, and now he was in a new place. And in this place of dishonor, his healing power was limited. It was held back. See, this, this dishonor, this, this atmosphere of dishonor disrupted the supernatural. And here's what I want you to, to know, is that in 35 years of ministry, one thing I've, I have seen over and over is that dishonor disrupts the supernatural. Dishonor disrupts the supernatural. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. This, this atmosphere of, of dishonor, that it can be so powerful that it actually is holding back everything you've been praying that would be released in your relationships, in your marriage, in your family. And I just have to wonder if, if maybe there are times that, that there's this, this greater healing that he wants to do in our relationships, greater joy that he wants to pour out in our families and in our community. Uh, 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 maybe there's something that we're missing in our marriage, and it's not because of lack of faith or sin. It's because of this atmosphere of dishonor, familiarity, and then I had to ask myself the question, if dishonor disrupts the supernatural, what could an atmosphere of honor release in the supernatural? What could an atmosphere of honor release in our relationships and over our community and in the supernatural when, when we honor Jesus and his word and we honor the people around us? And, and I love this thought because this passage, it, they, they weren't treating, um, the, the, it's the word dishonor in this passage um, wasn't that they were being rude or harsh. Actually, the definition um, of dishonor in the Greek, in this context, is, to, is from the Greek word atime. It means to treat as common and ordinary. Not rude or harsh, even though that's very dishonoring. In this passage, they were just treating Jesus as common. Like, what he came to do was just common. And what Jesus came to do for each of us, it isn't common. It isn't ordinary, it deserves, it's weighty, it's priceless, it's precious, and it deserves priority and attention in our lives. And, and when, we, when we honor him, it lays the foundation of honor in our relationships. And when I read this, I'm challenged because I think about those people that were so close to Jesus that they actually missed out on everything he came to do. And then I started thinking, wow, what, what, if, we're, what if we're missing out? What if we're, we're coming to church and we're having our quiet time, but we're missing out on the greater work of what he wants to do? And I know that, that this, this whole idea of honor is kind of hard for some of us in our culture to fathom because there is a honor void, a void of honor in our culture. All you have to do is just look around on social media. We live in a cancel culture, right? You say something that I disagree with, you're out. I unfriend you. You turn on the television and, and almost every TV show you see kids disrespecting and dishonoring their parents. But even though honor, it's a word we don't talk about much in our culture, even though it's, it's absent in our culture, it is a very present theme in the word of God. As a matter of fact, the word honor 
And this theme of honor is actually mentioned 147 times in scripture. And almost every single time it's mentioned, it's talking about honoring the people that God's put in our lives. And, and the definition of honor is, is this, it's, it's time, it means to value, to treat as precious and weighty. It's giving weight and value to who and what God values the most. And who does God value the most? He values people. There is not one person you're in relationship with right now that he did not give his life for. They were precious and weighty. And what he's saying is that, that we need to give value to who God values. And when we do this, we actually cultivate this atmosphere of honor in our relationships, in our homes, in our families, in our friendships, in our community. And when we do this, I really believe that it creates the space and place for the Holy Spirit to be released, right? We're not limited. When we have an atmosphere of honor, we're not limited to our, our, our relationship, limited to our weaknesses. We actually have the strength of the Holy Spirit that we're inviting into our relationships. Our relationships aren't limited by our own personalities and all the personality profiles we do to make sure we connect and all of that. We're actually, we're actually inviting the, the person of the Holy Spirit to release something in our relationships that we can't release on our own. But it can be released in an atmosphere of honor. And so there, there's many ways that, that we can release honor, but you might wanna know, how do I release the power, the supernatural power of honor in my relationships? And I'm so glad that you asked, because the first thing you need to do is you have to choose it. You have to choose honor. Honor will not come naturally. It's completely unnatural. It's supernatural. We're never going to, we're never just going to fall in to honoring. See, honor is not a feeling that we have, it's actually a commitment that we make. We have to choose it. And, it, and it takes effort and intentionality. And honor starts by honoring God. I love this scripture. We can't pass by this because this is the foundation. 1 Timothy 1.17, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, and the, only, and the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. All honor starts with God. It starts with honoring for who he is and all that he's done and the sacrifice that he made by sending his son so that we could have relationship and eternity with him. We honor him when we, when we give his word a priority place in our lives and our relationships. This is, we, on, we give him honor. We lay the foundation of honor in our relationships. We honor him by honoring his family, the, this inheritance that he gave us to be and, and to be in community together. 1 Samuel 2.30 says, and then this is God speaking, those who honor me, I will honor. I mean, we don't, th think of the God who deserves all honor, and we've done nothing to deserve it. He says, I'm gonna honor you when you honor me. And we don't honor God for some reward, but here's the truth. We have a God who loves to reward. This, th he loves to reward us. And so this is kind of a sowing and reaping kind of principle that he put into place. You honor me, then I will, I will pour out honor, and it's gonna be part of your inheritance. And you see this all throughout scripture. Abraham, when he obeyed God and, and stepped out in obedience, God honored him by, by making him a father of many nations. Noah honored God with his obedience against all odds, against the culture, and God honored him by saving his family and generations to come. Mary, when she honored God by saying yes, yes, Lord, whatever, whatever you want, I'll do it. She honored him by, by she, she honored him, he honored her by delivering hope into the world, using this vessel to deliver hope into the world. It's, this, is, this is so consistent through scripture that, that favor and blessing always follow honor. And this is what we want in our relationships, the favor and the blessing of God. And we see this, but the truth is, is that the way that we honor God, the way that we demonstrate our honor to God is the way that we honor the people that he values and he cares for the most. There, this, is, this, is what, this is how people are gonna know we honor God and how it's lived out. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second one is like it, and that's translated is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. It's not that loving your neighbor is, is more important than loving God. It's just that loving your neighbor and the people closest to you is proof that you do love God, 
right? This is, this is the proof. And so the scripture is full of this. And I can go through so many passages. I'm going to focus on marriage a little bit. But these principles are actually, this is, this is a biblical principle for whether you're single, whether you're married, whatever relationship you're in right now. Hey, I mean, we, we read in Ephesians and 1 Peter, it tells us to honor your husband and wife. And in Hebrews 13.4, it says, honor your marriage and its vows. And I love watching newlywed couples. You know, my, my son and daughter-in-law, it's like they're, they're waiting for each other at the end of the day. There's hot cooked meals waiting on the table. And it's like, oh, Pookie, can I do anything for you? Oh, no, Pookie, what can I do for you? Can I get something for you, Pookie? Oh, no, let me, let me, let me rub your feet. And a couple months later, you're like, Pookie, you've got two feet. Go get it yourself, right? <laughs> See, a few months down the road, we become familiar. We start to treat the person, this precious gift that God gave us, the one that we said we would honor as familiar and, and common and ordinary. Remember, dishonor isn't about rude or harsh. It's, it's treating people as common and ordinary. And there's lots of ways we can choose to honor. And I just wrote down a few practical ones. And I, I, I just want you to know that, that these, again, can be applied to every relationship. We choose honor I love, this is for married couples. We choose not to compare. In Song of Solomon, it says this. In Song of Solomon 6, 8, the king describes his love. And he says, there is no one like you on the earth. You are a woman beyond compare. Wow. There will never be. There, I'm sorry, there, there never has been, never will be. You are a woman beyond compare. Your spouse needs to know that there's no one compared to them. Right? And when we start comparing our spouse to some, some ideal in culture that is completely unrealistic, the way they look or the way they are, when, when we start comparing how you know, my friend's husband treats her, my friend, and, and how you treat me, and we start bringing comparison into the relationship, comparison is the thief of joy. And it will rob your marriage of all the joy that it has. And this is the deal, is that comparison also is a withdrawal. And comparison creates insecurity. And, and this is, security is actually what honor creates security, and security creates intimacy. And I think a lot of times we think that we have communication problems or we have sex problems, right? We think that those are the problems, but the greatest communication, the greatest sex happens in a secure, intimate environment. Honor is the foundation. Honor creates security. Security creates intimacy. And the best relationships are found and the best sex is found in secure, intimate environments. So we've got to choose not to compare. We choose to, to have honor mentors, to have people in our lives that, are, that we can look to. And, and um, Onika talked about this last week, to have people in our lives that we can look to, that sociologists say you're going to be the, the average of your five closest friends. That means that, that you, your marriage is going to be the average of the five closest married couples that you spend time with. You need to have people that are ahead of you. I have an, a couple that are 86 years old. They've been, married, they've been married 56 years, and they are our honor mentors. And I watch the way they've honored each other. And any place that, that you need to grow in, you need to have mentors in. We also need to choose to be honorable. The greatest gift Todd has ever given our marriage is I, he's never given me a reason not to trust him. And so I can pick up a cell phone at any time. We got to choose to be honorable, especially before you're married. If there's any habit or anything that would keep you from stepping into the, a marriage, a relationship with honor. It's important that, that we, we put those things aside so that we can become a person of honor. Remember, if we're going to have something different than what everybody else has, we got to do something different than what everybody else is doing. So we got to choose honor. we got to speak honor. We have to become fluent in the language of honor. And when you think about the fact that we speak, um, research says that, that People speak, the average person speaks 25,000 words a day. That's enough to fill 50 books a year. And so you have to ask, I've had to ask myself the question, you know, are the words that I'm speaking, are they, are they, are they speaking and, and echoing God's voice over the people around me? Or are they reinforcing a lie maybe the enemy has told them? See, our words are going to shape the atmosphere of our home, and it's going to either release or constrain the supernatural work that God wants to do. Environments are built on our words. Words are going to create an environment in all of our relationships. And when you think about when God spoke the word, world into existence, how did he do it? With words. Everything in the world that you see was first a word. And so when Jesus was on the earth, he spoke to storms. He, he shouted at Lazarus, 
And when you think about we've been created in his image and we speak words like, I'm sorry, please forgive me. These, these are power tools, right? They, they, will speak, they will speak calm and peace to a relationship that's in a storm. When, when we say, well, how can I serve you? How can I honor you? It's actually gonna breathe life into dead places in our relationship. But you know, it's not just the words that we speak to each other. It's the words that we speak about each other and the words that we speak over our relationships. And this is where I wanna land just a little bit is that we need to make honor a daily habit. We need to make honor a daily habit. And a couple of years back in 2020, it was rough on all of us. I actually um, was in a season where the people around me were not getting the best of me, especially my, my husband and my family. And, and in that season, I realized that as hard as I was trying, frustration and stress was getting the best of my relationships. And I knew that I had to do something different. And so just like any other, any, any other thing that is worthwhile, it takes time and intentionality. And I knew that I heard a truth in that time that, that our lives move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And I knew the thoughts that I had at the beginning of the day were shaping my attitudes, that were shaping my actions. And I needed to, to make a deposit, a deposit in the words that I spoke over my relationships and to move in a different direction. And during that season, I, I started two daily practices that have impacted every relationship I'm in. And the first is the practice of gratitude, that every day I write down five things that I'm grateful for. One of them is always about my husband, Todd. And I'll write one thing I'm grateful about him, and then sometime during the day, I'll make sure I tell him about it. Because you can't criticize and be grateful at the same time. And the second thing is, is that I would, I would find one person I'm in a relationship struggle with, and I would write something I'm grateful about them and I would actually let them know sometime during the day. But one of the greatest impartations in this season was that I began writing daily declarations to inform my relationships, to declare God's word over every relationship I'm in. I don't have time to read them all, but the first one is to declare honor over my, the words I speak to declare honor over my home and over the atmosphere that I knew that I needed, to, I needed help in creating. And the first one was this, is that at the beginning of the day, and I read these every day, is that Jesus, you're first in my life. I exist to glorify you. You are for me and you want me to flourish. I will order my life to grow closer to you. It lays the foundation. And the second one, because, because um, 2020 was really rough on relationships and sometimes I needed a reminder, and the second one was this, it was for my husband. I love my husband. I will honor him by the way I look at him, by the way I talk to him, and by the way I talk to others about him. I will make him glad that he married me. And can I just say that this is a good time to tell you these, these are much more aspirational than factual, right? I mean, there are times that I've declared this at 6.30 and by 9.30, Todd, I know is wondering why on earth he married me. But, this is not me every day, but it's more me today than it was three years ago. Because this is the deal, that, that when, when, you, when, you go, when you build a daily habit, right, consistency over time is what makes what once seemed impossible automatic. Think about when you were, a, a, if you have a toddler and you've watched them ever try to brush their teeth or tie their shoe, it's really super awkward and it's difficult. But guys, every one of you were a toddler at one time and you brush your teeth hopefully every day, and you tie your shoes, and it's automatic, because why? Consistency over time. And so we need to make honor this daily habit. It needs to be a part of our culture and our atmosphere. And so I just have this one challenge for you, and it's from the scripture in Romans, and Romans 12.10, it says this. It says that to love one another with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor. What are you believing for? What relationship right now you know is in a struggle, you know it's not where it needs to be, what are you believing for God to do? What, what, do, you, what do you want God to do? And maybe you've, you've actually given up. I want you to know that, that God has a better word to speak over that relationship. And I really believe the key is right here. I love that word. It says to outdo one another in honor. I love the word outdo because it's a competitive word. And I played high school and college sports and now I've channeled all of that competitive energy into this card game that I play with all of our staff at home. And I, had a, a, I have a strategy whenever I'm playing a game. And it is that I never look at the score while we're playing. I always think that I'm losing. 
Because when I think that I'm losing, I have to come from behind, right? And, and that gives me an edge. And this is what I believe that this is the kind of edge we need when we're talking about outdoing each other in honor. We need to approach it like we're coming from behind because we are. Because the enemy has robbed and killed relationships because of dishonor, right? Trying to rob the joy and the supernatural strength that the Holy Spirit wants to pour into your relationships. And so we are coming from behind. But this, this outdo each other with honor means that, that when the enemy knows when there's a void of honor and he wants to rob us of this inheritance, we're actually making a deposit. And so I want you to think about that relationship. And if you're married, you're allowed to think of two relationships, right? You can think of your, your spouse and one other person that, that you know your relationship isn't where it should be. And I want, you to, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture them right now. And I want you to think about how you can outdo them in honor. What will you do to outdo them? And you're gonna say, Julie, that's gonna be really easy because, because they, 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 they don't honor me and they, they're doing nothing. Well, great, you win. You, you just won, right? And can I just remind you that, that honor and respect are two different things. Respect is earned, honor is given. Honor is a gift that you can give your relationship and you can be a person of honor and outdo and when you bring that into a relationship, what will you do? Maybe it's writing your own declaration. Maybe it's, it's becoming more grateful, sending a gratitude text. Maybe, maybe it's if your marriage is in real trouble, it's, it's getting, honoring God and honoring your marriage by, by getting the help that you need in these coming weeks. Whatever it is, whatever it is, that my challenge is that you would do one thing to begin making honor a daily habit, and to outdo that other person in honor. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And I wanna pray for us. And first, I wanna pray for those relationships. And I just want you to open up your hands and just a posture of receptivity, because I wanna pray for every relationship represented in this room. God, I just thank you for all that you, you are doing, that you are, you are so worthy of honor and praise, and yet you choose to honor us. I pray, God, that there would be, that there would be a, an outpouring of honor as we honor you and honor those that you've placed in our lives. I pray, God, that you would bring freedom where there has been habits or addictions, that, that you would bring strength, that you would bring freedom in marriages, that you would bring a supernatural stirring of your spirit, that, that relationships would, would be different. I pray, God, that you would be the friendships that have been torn apart, that you would bring them back together. God, I pray that you would give us revelation of how to honor those in our lives so that we can experience the outpouring of your spirit. God, sometimes the greatest work that you wanna do isn't for the relationship, but it's in us. It's, it's, it's a, a deeper work in us so that we can be carriers of your culture, carriers of your supernatural presence in every relationship that we're in. And with every head bowed and your eyes closed, you may be here today and you might say, Julie, I want everything that Jesus has for me and everything that he has for my relationships. And yet I know that, that I've never actually fully committed my life to him. And if that's you and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want you to know you can have that today and you can have everything, the full abundant life that he came to give. Or maybe you're here and you, you had a relationship but you know it's not where it should be. I wanna pray for you. And if that's you, if you want a new relationship or if you want to, to restart a relationship so that it will be everything that God wants it to be, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Yeah, keep your hand up. Yes, yeah. I wanna pray for you, I wanna pray this prayer. We're all gonna pray it together, but you're gonna pray it a little bit louder because this is your prayer. Church, let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me right where I am. I want to honor you with my life. I wanna honor you in my relationships. I want to be a new person. Would you forgive me of my sin? Make me a new person from the inside out and I will live for you all the days of my life. Amen, amen, church.